Hi, welcome to Brown Girl Book Lover. I'm Leslie Ann Murray. Thanks for joining me. It's the third episode, and today I'm talking to about not to. I'm talking about whatever happens to interracial love by Kathleen Collins. I love this book, and when I saw everyone talking about it, I was like, I need to go get this book. So, a couple. Maybe a year or two, I went to get the book, and I took the book with me when I was traveling through um, out Norway, and it was just great to have this this book in such in this different land, but this book that is speaking to me in a strange land. It was nice. It was almost like it was like being home in the book. So I'll tell you a little bit about the book, and I'll tell you about my favorite stories, and we'll keep it moving. Okay, this is a linked short story collection. In ways, the collection feels novelistic because each story is followed this unnamed narrator um, who's trying to define her own destiny. We see this narrator from many stages of her life and how she grapples with external racism and internal racism in her family and the black community. Um, we see her grappling with being a divorcee. We see her dealing with the wounds of childhood. And we see how she carves out her own position in the world without the expectations and the labels of others. When I was reading this book, I kept thinking about the unnamed narrator because in Collins's uh, collection, uh, there's an un the woman we are following, she's un an unnamed narrator. And I kept thinking about the unnamed narrator in Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison Edison and how these two characters shared a lot of similarity but unlike um the unnamed narrator in Edison's character I think uh Collins's character she she comes from this black middle class background where she's been interacting with differences in terms of race class and identity and it has helped her helped her to name the contradictions and constructions of these worlds. Unlike Edison's character who went through this world really blindly and only until he became the invisible man that he was fully able to understand the contradictions and construction of the world, right? So anyway, so what I like about this book, it's a book we've all wanted to read without knowing we wanted to read a book like this. Uh, it names things without being dogmatic, and it allows this black woman character and the secondary characters to embody a, embody a, a myriad of identities. Um, I like how she calls out things without saying, hey, I'm calling this out, y'all. Like, So the title of the book, um, Whatever Happened to Interracial Love, is fastidious, fetitious. Right? Um, when she's asking whatever happened to interracial love, she knows the question, right? It's a rhetorical question. And she's not saying that interracial, there was a good thing that was with interracial love and now it became bad, or there was a bad thing with interracial love and it became good. She's saying that we we never had interracial love because of the history of um, segregation, the history of slavery, the history of violence in our society. And when during this era where the book was taking place in the 1960s, many people were s seeking a conversion of the races and saying, whatever happened to interracial love, why don't we have it? But we don't have it because of our history. And the book is it's challenging us to come to terms with that history before we move forward. So like I like the title because when we approach the title, we're like, yeah, whatever happened to interracial love? We were so connected and cool with each other, but we never were, right? And that challenges us to then say, then how can we create um, interracial love, right? And love amounts ourselves. And a, a united love, which I like that. Um, so I'll tell you like three of the, well, four of the, the stories I like. I like all the stories because it's really crafty. It's very smart. Um, and it, it 
leaves you lingering. I love that the narrator is very honest and a lot of the stories are very it's it's creative, right? So we may not have the traditional point of view in a story. The point of views move all over. I love the story Uncle. I love the story Stepping Back. I love the story Broken Spirit and the title story Whatever Happened to Interracial Love. I will read you um the start of Uncle because I love it. Okay. I had an uncle once who cried himself to sleep. Yes, it's quite a true story and it ended badly. That is to say, one night he cried himself to death. He was close to 40, a former athlete of Olympic stature. The fact that she opens a story with death, right? So we know we know what's the plot of the story already. But it's only two pages. And at the end of the story, we understand that this uncle died because he was depressed. And his depression stemmed from racism and alienation and poverty. And the fact that this writer can be so bold and upfront to talk about depression and within a black man, I just thought it was so phenomenal. And yeah, I I just thought it was so phenomenal to talk about depression from this stage because in our society, there are a lot of people talking about mental health, mental health issues in our society, um, and especially in the black community. But I think many times we we don't we tend not to put black men into that experience of mental health, right? We tend to make black men into a pathology, and this story breaks down that and it's not a pathology at times it's mental health issues and it humanizes black men and her uncle and so we can further understand them and that's why I like the story and also the fact that she's speaking how racism classism poverty all these things really affect someone's mental health and in two pages that is great. And again, it's not dogmatic. It's not like, listen here, racism messed my uncle up. But through this beautiful weaving and through subtlety, we understand that. And it's so gorgeous. It's it's yummy. Um, okay, I'll read 80, um, stepping back, 87. Okay, if I don't know if you can see it, but I have like written up in this book so much. Love this book. Okay. 87 voila okay i love the start of the the introductions are it grabs you and it's not you know it just grabs you and in its subtlety right i'm not trying to flatter myself but i was the first colored woman he ever seriously considered loving i know i was the first one who had the kind of savoir faire he believed in so devoutly the first one with class, style, poetry, taste, elegance, repartee, and hot cuisine. Because you know, a colored woman with class is still an exceptional creature. And a colored woman with class, style, poetry, taste, elegance, repartee, and hot cuisine is almost non is almost a non existent species. Again, she's using a satirical tone to really talk about classism in the black community because this story deals with these two black couple and this black man who likes this black woman because she has class, rapate, all these things, which is not totally common, which he believes is not common for, for a black woman. And yeah. I love that she she's speaking about class in the black community, which is an important thing to speak about and to deconstruct, right? Because because it's important to understand how class shapes our existence and our lives and how class also creates this 
sometimes exceptionalism, right? People believe they're exceptional because of their class. And she's critiquing that. And which is, which is very smart. And that's why I like it. And it's between these two, two black people trying to love each other, but they can't love each other because they have, they're tr performing this idea of class and class stops them from authentically loving each other, right? And <laughs> I'm just, I think, and she uses humor and she's fastidious in order for us to understand the subject matter, right? So if you read it on one level, you might think, oh, wow, that's kind of a weird construction. But you can understand that this writer is very funny and she's using this, she's using humor to challenge us. I love the story. Um, yeah, I, I really adore this book. Okay, now I hope I'm making sense. Broken Spirit, 113. Voila. 113. Oh, okay, so this story is Broken Spirit, and I'm going to read you a line. I. Oh, okay, so this story is really great because it's about this South African uh, writer who comes to New York and... The narrator, uh, the unnamed narrator, the linked narrator met him and they're talking. And it's interesting because the South African writer, apartheid is still going on. And this black woman, she is, this is in the 1960s. And both of these people are citizens of their country, but because of racism and apartheid, they're outsiders, they're marginalized. And so these two marginalized black people are dating and the South African is telling her wow I can't imagine the life I can't imagine living like this and she's but at, at the same time the South African is living like that right and sometimes we don't understand our existence or the trauma of it until we see it in another person yeah so she's dating this guy and she's and she says I could I could choke on his debt and on his cool aloof self refusing to live with a broken spirit no my friend you didn't go and do that so the south african guy you know eventually kills himself in the story and yeah this is a three-page story and we have love and debt and suicide I, I it's brilliant and i could choke on his debt and his cool aloof self Refusing to live with a broken spirit. I, I just thought that was a beautiful line. I'm not advocating suicide, but the writer is saying that I, he didn't want to be a prisoner, a mental prisoner or physically imprisoned by his country. So he chose to kill himself. And I, I just thought that was, that was so interesting. Um, yeah. So in terms of craft, this book, if you are a short story writer and you want to work on, um, you're working on a linked short story collection, I recommend in looking at this, uh, looking at this book as a way to help you craft a story because the first story is the, it's almost like you're looking at, um, a flim script, right? It's like interior, husband, it's a long improvision, my life, I don't know. So it starts off like you're looking at a script and then every story is different and every story has this physical and emotional arc. Um, some stories are just letters between a husband and a wife. Um, some stories are really long, some stories are really short. And I think you know, one story is almost like a script. When, so before I read this book, I was working on, tirelessly working on this short story collection that wasn't going anywhere. And after reading this book, it triggered something in me and it told me, your story needs to be honest. Your story needs to be bold, your collection. 
And your narrator needs to be like this woman. She needs to name things. And she needs to feel okay, confident, and brave in naming those things. And you have to, like... I, I When I was writing my collection before, my narrator's wings were clipped really tight. And I wanted her to move all these places. But this told me to relax. Give her her, her own identity and her own space. And let her grow within the collection. So I stopped writing my collection. And I started off... And this voice, when I said, okay, I'm going to free you, narrator. I'm going to let you be you. I'm not going to control you anymore. And when I did that, my, the true story that I've been trying to write actually came. And I'm like 75% with my, my um, collection. And it's, an, it's like this. It's almost, it's a novelistic short story collection. And this book really helped me to just free myself and write, write, write the truth, write truth, write truth. And I want to tell you that if you're writing, write the truth. If you're reading, read the truth. Um, Remember, we're all in charge of shifting the literary canon. We're all in charge of merging to the center and we're all in charge of writing the truth, especially in this time where the truth just seems as something that can be made up, right? So write the truth, tell your own stories. Thank you for looking at Brown Girl Book Lover.